Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. You're listening to a new episode of Stories from Space Podcast, where your host, Matthew Williams, examines the history of human spaceflight, the breakthroughs that revolutionized our understanding of the universe and our place in it, and the brave individuals who work tirelessly to advance the frontiers of our understanding. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Hello, and welcome back to Stories from Space. I'm your host, Matt Williams. Joining me today are two key figures who are working towards one of the most fascinating and ambitious concepts of our time, the space elevator. Please welcome Adrian Nixon and Dr. Peter Swan. Gentlemen, welcome aboard. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Nice to see you. So what I would want to mention, first of all, is that both these gentlemen here are members of the International Space Elevator Consortium, and they are the ones representing space elevators to the public and conducting outreach and education and also scientific research and development so that this can be realized. So, uh, Adrian, why don't we start with you? What can you tell us about yourself? Of more of relevance to this discussion, I'm a board member of the International Space Elevator Consortium. Uh, you'll find out about Pete in a minute. Um, I'm a, an industrial chemist by background, so I've spent quite a number of years in industry wearing a white coat, inventing things, and then climbing up the corporate ladder into management, into information systems, then into global consulting, then found that a little bit tedious set up my own company doing strategic consulting and then started to look at future trends. And one of the uh, really important trends that kept popping out was this material called graphene that we'll hear about later. And then that led me on to uh, discover the space elevator. And my life has changed considerably since then. So I've now set up a publishing company, uh, which briefs uh, very large corporations about graphene and 2D materials. I'm the editor as well as one of the founding directors. And I balance that up with the work at ISEC. So in a nutshell, I'm a, ke- a chemist, a bit of a geek, and uh, I tend to sort of get interested in spacey things from a materials point of view. I'd say this this show is uh, going to feel just like home. <laughs> so, yes. I feel like uh, Yes, Dr. Swan, what can you tell us about yourself and your work? Well, my background has always been engineering, and then that led to management, of course, and leadership. It turns out I started in space because I really, really was excited by that whole topic area. I've ended up testing spacecraft. I built spacecraft. I've tracked spacecraft, I've led teams in management and building of new spacecraft, Uh, ended up in uh, the civilian or commercial Iridium system leading the development of the spacecraft bus. And then I ended up teaching for 15 years, how do you build a space system? And along the line, I ran into the space elevator and fell in love with it. And my passion is to make the space elevator reality. And so I've been uh, a member of the ISIC for many, many years. At the present time, I'm president and member of the board of directors. But the real kicker is ISIC has a vision that I think is really worth going over real quickly. And it's that we believe that the space elevators are the green road to space where they enable humanity's most important missions by moving massive tonnage to geo and beyond. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you realize that ISIC is working to develop space elevators, you get a feel for where Adrian and I are. We truly believe it will happen, and we're trying to build the body of knowledge so that we can then execute a program. I believe we're at the beginning of the execution of the program, and there are many, many steps left, many, many challenges, and we'll talk about that during this podcast. So I'm mm-hmm. looking forward to the discussion. Yes, me too. Just quickly for readers, I want to touch on uh, a couple of abbreviations that have been mentioned. So for example, ISEC is the International Space Elevator Consortium. And Dr. Swan, you said geo, by which you mean a geostationary orbit. So yeah, 
high, high above the Earth, beyond low Earth orbit, where most uh, most of our satellites and the ISS are. Okay, so the first question I wanted to ask you is the idea of the space elevator. It's a it's a very time honored concept, isn't it? And it goes back to father of Russian and Soviet rocketry, uh, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky. He proposed this in 1895. He witnessed the Eiffel Tower and he started talking seriously about building a structure to space. But yeah, he envisioned it as a like a standing tower. He acknowledged that, oh, there's no known material that could do this. But by the time the space age set in, you had a situation where pretty much every generation scientists went back and looked at it and said, well, what about a suspension structure? So can you can you briefly explain for those who may not be familiar, what, what exactly does a space elevator look like? OK, the space elevator is a relatively simplistic concept. If you take a rock, put a little rope on it and twirl it around your head, that's the concept. What it is, is the Earth turns, it has a long rope that goes out 100,000 kilometers, and we have a rock on the other end. And the outward force provides a tension in the tether so that it's a stiff tether, and then you can climb it like Jack and the Beanstalk. And the idea is that we're using electricity to climb with solar cells. So therefore, there's no rockets required and we don't burn anything in the atmosphere. It just climbs up the rope until it gets to the appropriate location for the mission. And then it drops off the cargo at that location. It mm -hmm. turns out it's extremely inexpensive. It's very, very safe. It's like routine operations of a train. And... It's environmentally friendly. So it really is a simple concept. It's kind of difficult to make it work. We're in the middle of trying to do all the engineering concepts, but it's a simplistic concept. It's just a rotating rock on the end of a string, keeping the tension on it, and then you climb it with a little train-like structure. It turns out that we've had a phenomenal growth over the last 100-plus years, uh, it turns out the suspension side was developed by another Russian in the uh, 1960 times, Yuri Artusanov. And then in the 75 time period, we had an American, Jerome Pearson, actually do all the calculations and show the development of a space elevator in engineering terms. And that was the big step. It turned out that Arthur C. Clarke saw that work that he had done and they worked together on the book, P Fountains of Paradise. So the scientific and the science fiction side have developed in parallel over the time. But then in 2002 or three, uh, Dr. Bradley Edwards came in with a NASA-sponsored study that said we can build the space elevator with the uh, development of a new material. And so the development of the new material was on the edge at that time, but he showed all the other aspects of the space elevator were essentially doable. And so since the 2002 time period, we've had the belief that it can be accomplished. And we've gone through multiple phases, and there was recently an article put out by David Raith that discussed the eight different architectures of space elevators, starting with Tchaikovsky and going all the way through what we call the modern day space elevator today. Let me just real quickly summarize what I mean by the modern day space elevator. Basically, we're entering the engineering development time frame. We recognize that the space elevator with its ability to raise cargo with electricity only will essentially be the green road to space and the space elevator will be a major partner with rockets. We plan on working with rockets in a dual space access strategy where we use the strengths of both the rockets and the space elevators to work together. And this leads to a tremendous capability to move massive amounts of cargo towards the planets, towards the moon, and up to this geosynchronous high altitude location where communication satellites excel. 
if you take an example of a river and boats going across little boats share uh, taking stuff across and you have a village on the other side when you put a permanent infrastructure a bridge across the river that little village on the other side becomes a thriving economic center and grows into a big city because what we have is very very low cost safe routine daily transport of goods to the the village over there so it's a transition from individual events that are expensive to continuous supply at low cost and so it's an economic change it's not just the dollars per kilogram but it's the impact on the other end of the destination or along the way so it's a very very good idea to compare the economics of a uh, putting train tracks in or putting a bridge in its infrastructure and that's what we're doing with space elevators so we have a modern day space elevator that is really on the brink of becoming real and it boils down to the material which transitions nicely to adrian summarizing where we are in the material sciences arena okay now adrian i want to get to to you here in a second there and uh I would like to loop back to the idea of how this is uh, the green road to space. But first, I want to say, historically speaking, the the benefits of a space elevator, they, they speak for themselves. There's always been significant challenges. But the one thing that has been a consistent deal breaker until recently has been the tether material. Yes. Um, so... Just to recap, we have, um, as Pete said, we've got this rock on the end of a string. So let's just imagine that we're standing on the equator. As the Earth spins round, that's the best place to put the base station for the space elevator. It's called the Earth port. And if you stood there, what you would see would be a piece of material which would go from a base station going straight up into the sky through the clouds and disappearing, and it wouldn't stop until it got 100,000 kilometres further out. And then that would be like Pete was saying, that's the equivalent of his bridge crossing the river. And the little village on the other side of the river is the International Space Station, which is flying around at the minute. There's just a handful of people up there at any one time. Um, but once we get that structure in place, then effectively you've got a railroad going straight up. That would then connect up, as Pete said, on a regular basis. You'd have a bus schedule, a train schedule, um, regular things going up and down. That immediately then begins to have a massive economic impact on whatever's at the other end, wherever you define the end of that to be. And all of a sudden, you turn space into an economic engine far more than it ever has been before. The The effect of that will be transformative. Yeah, so... Throughout the uh, the 20th century, research study after research study, the, the conclusion was we don't know of any material currently that could withstand the tensile pressure or the the weight of the whole structure. It would it would just it would simply snap. But there was renewed enthusiasm around the early 2000s with carbon nanotubes. But even those were problematic, weren't they? Yeah, there's the rub. All these things need to be the material to make the, the tether out of has to be both incredibly strong in tension so the uh, tensile strengths uh, but also incredibly lightweight let's just do a little thought experiment for the listeners so you imagine you're standing on the top of a, an infinitely high cliff and you are infinitely strong so you're a superhero and you've got this uh, very strong uh, steel cable, you know, the sort of thing that's used for standard elevators and buildings at the moment. And if you pay that cable out, so you're feeding it out through your arms and dropping it over the edge of this cliff, eventually you'll recognize that the bit that's dangling down over the edge of the cliff has mass. And it, as you're paying out more and more cable, you're you're increasing the mass, the amount of weight that you're having to... Uh, hold up and eventually because you're in, you're infinitely strong superhero you, you're not worried about the mass but the material itself is and eventually it pulls apart under its own weight so uh it it's its own weight or the the mass of the material that's dangling down pulls on the bit that you're holding and eventually the thing snaps that's called the breaking length 
So you don't need steel, and uh, Kevlar isn't strong enough, and Aramid, which is sort of Kevlarish material, these really high-strength polymers that we've got at the moment for making bulletproof vests, they're not even strong enough. Arthur C. Clarke recognised that the carbon-carbon bond was probably the strongest, lightest material in the world. And in his book, The Fountains of Paradise, he envisaged that the tether material was made out of what he called diamond nanofilament or oh. nano thread and is basically uh, a thread made of continuous uh, bonds of diamond going all the way up carbon connected together the only problem is nobody's ever made that stuff so it was imagination but clark is a scientist and he was on the right track now in clark wrote the book the fountains of paradise pete was it about the 1970s i think from memory mid 70s well, yes yeah it wasn't until another 20 years when a material called carbon nanotubes um, were discovered. This was, they were about, was it about the 1990s, Pete? Early 90s, something like that for nanotubes? A lot of excitement at the turn of that century, yes. Yeah. And the reason was, if you can imagine something that looks like the inside of a toilet roll, but just very, very long, and it's made of chicken wire that's wrapped up into a tube. But basically, you've got these very the microscopic or nanoscopic tubes, a bit like uh, these um, chicken wire toilet toilet roll cores, which are very, very small, very thin, but um, potentially very long. So if you want to try and pull one of these things apart, you've got to put a huge amount of force in to tear these carbon nanotubes apart. And they reckon somewhere in the region of 70 to 200 gigapascals. Now... A human hair, if you plucked a hair out of your head and tried to pull it apart, you've probably got a force of somewhere in the region of about 10 megapascals to actually overcome the breaking strength of that hair. This carbon nanotubes, to tear them apart, they're going to be somewhere in the region of about 100 gigapascals. So it's four orders of magnitude stronger than a human hair would be. So it's pretty strong stuff. Um, and there's a lot of excitement, as Pete said. And then NASA uh, commissioned Bradley Edwards to do a feasibility study on the space elevator and said, look, is this science fiction or is it engineering reality? And NASA came, uh, Bradley Edwards came back and said, do you know what? All the bits to do with the space elevator could be done with today's materials. So you can build the Earth port, you could build the climbers, they could all be done with today's technology, you could build the stuff up in space because we're doing that already. The only thing that's missing is the material you make the tether out of. And the best candidate is carbon nanotubes, but we can't make them long enough yet. But just wait, they'll come along. Anyway, we fast forward a couple of decades and we're still waiting for carbon nanotubes to be made long enough. And everybody's expectations have been raised and the industrial capability to produce carbon nanotubes hasn't delivered on the promise. And a lot of people have sort of gone, oh, the, you know what, this is just hype. Let's turn away, we'll go back to rockets, forget about the space elevator, it's never going to happen. And until recently, that's where we were so far. Yes. And this is where we get to Graphy, which in fact... That final report to NASA there, it was a year later that graphene was isolated for the first time. Yes, in 2004. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good observation, Matthew. Yeah. So uh, Bradley Edwards' report to NASA uh, reported in 2003 and, th and said carbon nanotubes are the thing. And since then, nobody can make them long enough. Now, in 2004, you're quite right, uh, two very bright physicists at the University of Manchester in the UK, uh, had what they call Friday night experiments. So they've, as well as their day job, uh, they set aside some time on Friday afternoons and Friday nights just to play around with mad ideas and daft things. And one of the things that they were working on was to actually look inside a material, an everyday material that everybody takes for granted called graphite, you know, the stuff in pencils. So you, you can imagine graphite is like, if you look at it under the microscope, it's basically like a, a structure made of lots of decks of playing cards all jumbled up together. And it's made from carbon. These decks of playing cards ha have inside them an individual card, which the decks are made up of. And this is made up of like um, carbon atoms, but they're connected together in a chicken wire arrangement. Not like carbon nanotubes where the chicken wires roll around into a tube. This time it's just sort of flat sheets Hence the playing card analogy. 
this had been known for probably ooh, probably a hundred years or so that this material inside graphite there were these uh, individual atomic layers of uh, this chicken wire like carbon, but. Uh, nobody ever believed that it could be isolated because it's only one atom thin. And if you tried to sort of isolate it, what would happen is there were books that proved it would just curl up by itself and roll into a ball and it would be thermodynamically unstable is what the physicists called it. So nobody ever really tried isolating this stuff. Anyway, these two physicists in Manchester, Andre Geim and Kostya Novoselov, they did a really clever, very simple experiment. So if you can imagine you've got a piece of graphite, so they've got a very pure crystal of graphite. They put it onto a piece of sticky tape, and then they put another piece of sticky tape on top of that. So you now just imagine what they've done. So you've got sticky tape, you've got a deck of playing cards, and then you've got another piece of sticky tape on the top. And then what they did was they cleaved it. So now we've got half a deck of cards on each bit. So then what they did was they get another piece of sticky tape on one of the samples that's left, and then they stick it on top and then cleave it apart again. And you keep on doing that, and about you do that about 17 times, and you actually get down to a single atomic layer of carbon. It's such a simple experiment. Nobody ever believed it would work, so nobody ever tried it, but these two did. So Andre and Kostya now proved that they they used electron microscopes various other things to prove it was a one atom thin layer of carbon and now they could begin to do something with it so then they used the facilities at the university of manchester they begged steeled and borrowed time on various bits of kit and prodded and poked it with expensive analytical tools and they found out a number of amazing things so this material this carbon chicken wire is 200 times stronger than steel, which is quite relevant to what we're interested in. It's transparent, it's flexible, it's got the highest melting point of any material known, so somewhere between 5,000 and 6,000 degrees in a vacuum. It conducts electricity six times better than copper. It's the world's best conductor of heat. If graphene was a, a person, it would be a superhero. You've, you're already aware that we've now got this super material. The only thing is, it was only available in very small quantities, uh, tiny little pieces inside graphite. Okay. So it kicked off a huge amount of interest. But because Andre and Costier had done two things, one, they'd isolated graphite, and everybody thought that would be impossible. And two, they did all these measurements and proved it was had all these amazing properties. They won the Nobel Prize for physics in 2010 for doing this work. And all of a sudden, the whole world went, whoa and starts to take serious interest in this material, which they called graphene because it comes from graphite. And in fact, right now, thanks to that interest and, and the applications it has for electronics, because of yep. how good a conductor it is, yeah. Well, that is what most research and development into manufacturing is sort of aimed towards, yeah? But, yeah, so... Uh, in the last sort of uh, intervening, what, 18 years since uh, it was isolated. So graphene has now been made in two forms. One is powders, where it's being used to for tremendous things already that listeners probably aren't aware of yet. But it's basically a performance additive that could be used in electronics, as you've been saying. Uh, you can make uh, sensors. People have made COVID sensors out of this, all sorts of stuff. Um, you can add it into polymers, make them a lot stronger. Uh, Ford Motor Company, um, if you've got a Ford car or, or a truck uh, that you purchased since about 2019, you're driving around in a graphene-enhanced car. Uh, it has graphene in the polymers underneath the bonnet, uh, underneath the hood of the car. And Ford are doing amazing things researching into graphene as we speak. That's the powder side, but we need a continuous piece of material going from the surface of the Earth out up into space. So we need large sheets of this stuff. And that's where it begins to, to get really interesting because the manufacturing process for making graphene on large scales has been moving faster than anybody realizes. In fact, um, this is where the progress has been happening, whereas carbon nanotubes haven't really advanced much. The, the current record is 50 centimeters, I think. Yep, yep. Yeah, uh, 50 it, that, that, was, that was for an individual carbon nanotube, but um, and that's only been done once or twice. So, uh, it couldn't be repeated very easily. The repeatable experiments sort of make about 140 millimetres, 14 centimetres, and they grow very slowly. It takes about 26 hours to make that 14 centimetres of carbon nanotube. So 
carbon nanotube technology is sort of still struggling a bit. Yeah. Meanwhile. Yes. And in fact, the, uh, the manufacturing process, um, chemical vapor deposition, if I'm remembering that. Spot on. Yes. You know oh. your stuff. <laughs> oh, thank you. So, yeah, uh, CVD uh, for short. That process was either invented or it's been advanced considerably th- at the University of Manchester and their, their graphene research outfit. Yep, but CVD, chemical vapor deposition, was actually invented by a lady called Margaret Dresselhaus, I think, in America, possibly MIT from memory. And uh, that was done in about 2010, 2009, 2010, that sort of time. So, yeah, only uh, a little bit more than a decade ago uh, as we speak. Basically, the idea is you get uh, methane gas, so for our Americans, uh, American listeners, methane. And if you can imagine, methane gas is a carbon atom with four hydrogens on it. So if you can imagine a three-legged stool with carbon as the seat, and you've got three little bonds going down with a little round thing on the end. So you've got three feet made of hydrogen. And then from the middle of the stool sticking up, you've got uh, another one with another blob on top. So you have four hydrogens arranged in like a tetrahedron around the middle carbon. And that's methane. And the trick is, it's very difficult to pull the hydrogens off to get at the carbon. What happens with the CVD process is you get methane gas very hot. So the carbon hydrogen bonds start to uh, weaken a bit. And this, when we say hot, we mean about a thousand degrees centigrade. Still, the hydrogens won't come off. But if you get the, uh, the methane gas down to the surface of a metal catalyst, in this case, copper, then what happens is the metal holds on to uh, the carbon and allows the hydrogens to come off. And the hydrogens disappear as hydrogen gas. So now we're left with a carbon atom stuck on the surface of the copper. Repeat that process time and time again. And what happens is you end up with a layer of carbon over coating the surface of the copper metal. And it connects up in a, the flattest shape or the lowest energy shape it can. And now, if you can imagine, you've got one carbon atom connected to three others in uh, like a, an equilateral triangle. And these things then connect up to form hexagons, and that's your chicken wire of carbon over the surface. That's how the uh, CVD process works. So you get methane gas very hot, 1,000 degrees centigrade. It produces hydrogen, uh, and it, this all screams, don't try this at home. Mm-hmm. Um, but you will make graphene stuck on copper foil, and that's how it's made at the moment. Mm-hmm. And it can it can produce it in significant quantities too. At the, this indeed, uh, yeah. When it was first yeah. produced in the early days, um, you could only make sort of square centimeters, you know, in a well, if you were lucky, and it would probably take a week to do that. Now the and this is the bit that people just don't realize: the manufacturing technology has been coming on leaps and bounds. MIT invented what's called a roll-to-roll process. So you have, if you can imagine, you have a reel of copper foil. Um, unreeling through a furnace and being reeled up at the other other end. And inside that furnace, this chemical vapor deposition reaction takes place. And so you have a continuous manufacturing process for laying down graphene on the surface of the metal foil. Now, other people around the world have taken this up. There's a company called General Graphene in Tennessee. Uh, they, they've just commissioned their Generation 3 machine, and they can now produce about 100,000 square meters of graphene per year. Um, LG Electronics in Korea have got another uh, similar sort of machine. It can produce graphene at the rate of a meter a minute, about 400 mil wide. The latest is there's a company called Charm Graphene, again in Korea, and they've just upped the speed. They can produce graphene at two meters a minute and in lengths of up to a kilometer already. So fantastic progress that's being made accelerating the manufacture of graphene at industrial quantities industrial speeds there's a couple of issues with where we're at at the minute we're not saying this is tether quality material graphene yet but you can see the trajectory we're on matthew this is moving really fast so yeah the current rate of progress well in fact that's another question here isec has a a timetable in mind Right, where the initial production or the initial operations with a space elevator, this would be ready to go by 2037? Yeah, it turns out that there have been a lot of discussions, but the bottom line is, yes, we would hope to have it done by 2037. 
And it's a mega project, which by definition is greater than a billion dollars in 10 years. And this would be like 20 billion over uh, 15 or so. So it qualifies as a mega project, which means that there are many challenges that are out there. But to have a product that ends up being beneficial, you must start before you have all the answers. So at this point, we have started building a space elevator. And the the rationale is that the benefits are so phenomenal that you have to push the envelope and keep charging. We believe the material will be ready for us by an operational date of 2037. We believe we can build it by then and all the other aspects are out there. Of course, there are challenges, but we believe the benefits are so overpowering that we really need to do it. Let me give you one example. The delivery of cargo to space is a principal factor if you want to dream big. If you want a settlement on the moon, if you want to have base solar power satellites saving the planet in the sense of uh, eliminating coal plants for electrical base energy, then you need to move a tremendous amount of mass. And rockets just don't have delivery statistics, which would enable these dreams of many. So what we need to do is we have to recognize space elevators can do remarkable things, daily routine, safely, inexpensively, environmentally friendly. We can lift mass. And when we talk about mass, we're talking about when we get going in operation, early operations, we'll have 30,000 tons per year raised to space. And you have to recognize that human have only lifted 26,000 tons to date since 1957. So the, the difference between rocket delivery and space elevator delivery is so remarkable that I believe we must start space elevators and we mm-hmm. must get them going. And so we go back to Adrian's uh, recognition that the technology is almost accelerating in the manufacturing arena of materials. And if you have accelerating developments in materials, then we can build space elevators. And therefore, we can impact the future of humanity in so many different ways. To quickly circle back, because I want to talk about the development efforts here. But yeah, the reason why it's a green technology, I mean, this has to do with the fact that graphene itself, the tether material, is such a wonderful conductor of electricity. So the climbers going up and down it are just drawing power through the tether to keep them going? Uh, the uh, ISIC just recently completed a 18-month uh, study with like about six or seven experts on it. And we came to the end and called the study the Green Road to Space because it has all the aspects. I'll, I'll explain that a little bit and then come back to your your mm-hmm. uh, statement. The aspects of the Green Road to Space are, one, we don't burn rocket fuel in the atmosphere. And there have been a lot of studies recently at very, very important uh, magazines and research centers that are saying that we have issues with burning rocket fuel in the atmospheres. In addition, we lift everything up and we have it reach our targets at the destinations. We don't leave anything in low Earth orbit or anything like that. Now, the rockets, the advanced rocket people, and I love rockets, okay? I went to Apollo 12 launch. I love rockets. The rocket people are doing remarkable jobs. They're doing reusability. They're lowering the cost uh, tremendously, and they're choosing some rocket fuels that are better, and I, and I really applaud them for all of that. But the essence of a rocket is different than raising things with electricity. The Mm -hmm. second thing about the green road to space is the mission of space elevators can reach across and improve the Earth's environment. An example is we can enable space solar power so that we can provide electricity around the globe without burning coal. In addition, we can eliminate a lot of the high-level nuclear waste by taking it out and tossing it toward the sun. So, The space elevator is inherently a green road to space that can lift massive amounts of cargo. 
Now, you mm-hmm. mentioned the, the conductivity of the material, and that's a very important aspect to research. One aspect of that is could could end up being the power to the tether climber is supplied through the cable, and that's a, a very viable approach. Another way that you don't have to burn rocket fuel is you use solar energy to solar cells that provide the electricity to the wheels. And so it's an energy efficient way to move something on a vertical cable. And you're perfectly correct. If we can provide the electricity through the cable, that would be delightful. There are other ways to do it. And, you know, who knows what's going to end up. This is one of those engineering trades that would be made over the next 10 years uh, as we trade off mass versus capability versus et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah. Matthew, it, I was, the way you were headed possibly with your question earlier was you've got um, this cable going through fluctuating magnetic fields or dynamic magnetic fields, and you've got an electric mm-hmm. current going through conductive material. So um, electric motors work by uh, having a coil, an electric current going through a coil in a magnetic field, and you get motion out, which is what makes a motor turn. And we could find that there is a force, a Lorentz force, on the actual tether material if it is electrically conductive moving throughout these uh, magnetic fields. So we're having to sort of come up with ways of thinking, one, thinking about that, two, trying to find data on the the magnetic fields up there. And it's actually quite surprising. Um, It's not that well researched by anybody. Um, and then secondly is if we we can mitigate the uh, the movement on the tether due to fluctuating magnetic fields and um, the electrical conductivity, if we can't, we have another two-dimensional material, which is an electrical insulator. It looks like graphene, but it's made of boron and nitrogen, and that's called hexagonal boron nitride, and that's an electrical insulator. So we have options for the future. Yeah. Looking to the future, ISEC has established a a company to help speed the development, haven't they? And that's the Galactic Harbor Associates? Yes, the Galactic Harbor Associates, the three of us that are part of ISEC, but we're really a separate uh, California company that is moving ahead on developing space elevators. Uh, Just like you have any association like the American Medical Association, and then you have all these companies doing medicine, same thing. Uh, we have IEEE, which is electrical engineering, and they have Boeing and all those other guys that are companies. So we're a startup industry. Just that would be the first real company dedicated toward the space elevator. But of course, we have to have somebody to build the tether climbers and somebody to build the materials. So there will be many companies formed in parallel to create a space elevator, and they'll all be supported by the industry support association called ISIC. The question is, what is a galactic harbor and how does it fit in the dual space access strategy where we're cooperating with rockets? The galactic harbor is a simple idea in that we have two space elevators going up from a common uh, location on the surface of the earth, uh, on the equator, in the ocean. And what happens is We have two tethers, one earth port with two tether terminus, but we have our headquarters and operation center there. And what we're able to do is run up and down simultaneously, and we could go up on both of them and then periodically bring stuff down on the second one, or you've got a principal and a backup. The real kicker is if you're going to have a commercial business, you really need to have those type of capabilities. Uh, maximum commerce or a, a backup for to ensure the business can continue. And so the Galactic Harbor is a basic idea. The idea also is to have three Galactic Harbors around the Earth's equator. We'd have one in the Pacific, one in the Atlantic, and one in the Indian Ocean. And we truly believe it's going to be a competitive commercial arena. Once one company builds a pair of space elevators and dominates the movement of mass out to space, the other two are going to be very quickly built so that there would be commercial competition or country competition or whatever competition. So we really see six space elevators inside three galactic harbors. 
in operations in parallel with the rocket community. The advanced rocket community is coming along well, and they're having all kinds of good successes in reusability and large. So we see a collaborative and cooperative arrangement between galactic harbors and advanced rockets that would really benefit humanity. Well, I like that. This is not, uh, yeah, this is not something that's going to drum the rocket enthusiasts out of business, but rather enable their more long-term visions. Uh, like, yeah, like we said. And the point, the point is, it's not uh, the fact that space elevator is in competition with rockets. Rockets need space elevator to deliver mass. Space elevator needs rockets to deliver sensitive and, and delicate things like people upstairs quickly. And in fact, your cost assessments, probably one of the most encouraging things here, right? It's like between the fact that the industrial process is advancing in an accelerating fashion, costs will will come down. And if I recall correctly, right now, the the cost to generate enough material for a tether would be in the ballpark of $18 billion. Mm-hmm. We have to remember that when we do anything new in a new concept, a new mega project, everything is estimated at the beginning. But then as you develop an industry, as you develop teams, all the different difficulties become achievable. So when you consider like that's that would be 18 billion over roughly a 10 year period, uh, which is a fraction of what NASA spends annually, their their current budget for 2022 is 24 billion. And you've estimated that it could actually get as low as three point six billion with uh, further development. Yeah, it, it turns out that the space elevator total cost is roughly eighteen billion dollars. That's what's been talked about for the last twenty years. Has been pretty solid. And if you think of eighteen billion dollars as an infrastructure cost, then you're talking about a whole different arena of investments. Because what we're talking about is building a railroad for $18 billion and then having that railroad supply materials at the destination for, you know, dollars on the kilogram or something. So we really talk in an economic arena. And the big investment up front is a economic investment in the future. So it's not like a return on investment in the near terms. It's a 18 year plus investment now adrian you had a comment on the the price or the cost of the graphene yeah uh, so we've been looking at not just the chemistry and the uh, the industrial engineering that's been going on but we've also been looking at the economics of graphene manufacturing the, the first piece of graphene was made in about 2010 and had costs put onto it. And that, that came in if you magnified up the uh, the area that was made. So we use a square meter as a standard unit. Then uh, to make that square meter would have cost roughly $10 million back in 2010. Now, since then, we've got a chart which shows the, the cost gradually dropping down to about a million dollars per square meter, just about 2018, 2019. Then all of a sudden, these roll-to-roll processes came out, which were previously in secret projects. And in 2021, we now calculated it costs $7.57 to make a square meter already. So you can see there's a fantastic decline in the manufacturing cost. Now, the unit cost of production is still going to have to get much lower. So uh, we're, we're dry. we reckon the costs need to be driven down to around about one cent per square meter over the next sort of uh, decade or so. And that's entirely doable with... Uh, economies of scale production and where we see the technology heading that's going to be needed because you're going to need an awful lot of material so you need to make this stuff incredibly fast very cheaply as well but all the stuff that we're seeing so far shows there's the economics for production is on track and if anybody wants to look at these figures then we write a uh, regular newsletter entries at uh, ISEC on our website at ISEC.org. And if you just go and have a look at the uh, newsletter archive, you'll find all the charts and all the information. Everything's referenced. It's all freely available from there. I'd like to add one thing there. When you are ma- making a, the strongest material available that is the best conductor in the world and you drive the prices down, 
then the manufacturing will go up tremendously because of uh, airplane wings, Corvette hoods, golf clubs, et cetera, et cetera. So the the material development is going to be driven by the commercial imperative and the space elevator community will leverage that development. And that's the way it's going to get down to a penny a a square meter because it's such a valuable material. Yeah. That's a very good point, Pete, because one of the things we haven't made clear to Matthew is the fact that we're not just talking about a single atomic layer of graphene here. We're talking about these layers stacked up on top of one another over a very large area, and that makes a bulk material. So the, the tether itself will be, as Pete said, about a metre wide, but it'll actually be 12,000 atomic layers thick. So it'd be about as thick as sarin wrap, if you have that in your part of the world. Um that thin film you put over to keep your food fresh. Uh, But that material there would, um, metre wide, four microns thin, that would support seven 20-ton climbers climbing up at once. Well, in fact, yes, that's that's something uh, I should have mentioned there. The idea is ultimately, yeah, to just put layer upon layer upon layer of this material together. And as I recall reading uh, not that long ago, it's also pretty good at stopping bullets. Indeed, yeah. You'd have yeah. something, yeah, you could have something as thin as cling film, uh, which we call it um, in UK, uh, but it would stop a bullet, yeah. Um, explosives would bounce off it, all sorts of things. You're talking about this new bulk material, uh, this layered material is the foundation for a new materials industrial revolution. It's not just space elevator, as Pete said, this is going to have uses left, right and centre and everything. Oh, yeah, the uh, the applications are quite endless. Last question here. Now, you gentlemen will be presenting at this year's uh, International Astronomical Congress, which will be held in Paris. And you're going to be talking about these very these very things, uh, the study of materials and, and which is best because of the manufacturing process involved. Yes, the IAC is a yearly peer-to-peer space community gathering of all the countries. So all the space experts show up all the administrators of the space organizations like NASA show up and talk. It turns out that the leadership of space shows up at these gatherings because they present the latest technologies in all the different areas. It really is a remarkable event. 5,000 people were at uh, Dubai last year. And in Paris, of course, everybody wants to go to Paris. So it's probably going to be more like eight or 10,000 people there. But it's a remarkable showing. and We have our own base elevator track on Monday afternoon, and we'll have like 16 different presentations. And we'll be discussing all the different aspects of space elevators from the top level vision all the way down to, you know, materials. Uh, Adrian's co-author on a materials paper. And we're going to be talking about the rest of the things. We've got a very good presentation, uh, actually, two from Japan. Uh, we've got multiple from other parts of Europe and the U.S. It really is a remarkable gathering of space experts yearly. And so we are going to be talking specifically. Uh, the first one is going to be a keynote speech on the strengths and a visionary approach to how do we approach space from the aspect of space elevators. And we'll go right on down to discussions on materials or dynamics or tethered climbers, structures. There'll be a lot of good technical papers during the, the afternoon. And I think, Pete, also, you might even be able to take some samples with you as well. I'm hoping to take some samples with me. We have some that were produced a year and a half ago that are, you know, like a cassette, like a CD cassette, but no CD in it, just a cassette to show the samples. So we should be able to show some of the materials uh, of graphene and explain the development. Uh, Adrian's paper is going to be an excellent one. I've seen the draft and it's going to be on where we are in the production of graphene and stuff like that and how it would be used in space elevators. Uh, so it it really is going to be a eye opening event for all of us, even the ones working in the industry. We'll get some updates on some of the real intriguing aspects of space elevators. 
And it's interesting to note, Matthew, you know, that the samples that Pete will show people just 18 years ago, people thought that would be impossible to make this stuff. And mm. already it's it's been made in industrial quantities. Yes. So we've gone from impossible to industrial in 18 years. Which that was uh, the name of a lecture you gave, what, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> yes. but it was, You're following what I do quite closely, uh, yes. Uh, what, like I said, you know, it, you guys have <laughs> talked uh, to me and I, I have, well, I've, you know, taken notes. Uh, I believe the title was 17 years old, as it happened uh, about a year ago. But uh, yep. yeah, yeah, it, that, that, yeah, that really that was not a talk that, yeah, yeah, NASA asked us to brief them on this stuff last year. Yeah. Well, that promises to be exciting, and um, I, I'm not sure I can attend, but I will be following it rigorously from uh, virtual capacity I possibly can. So, so yeah, I look forward to seeing what uh, what you guys have to say there, and also wish you luck in the whole realization uh, effort. Yes. Because, yeah, this, yeah, because yeah. um, you, you've said this, and this is something that I've certainly, it's come to mind before, it's like, the price tag on this, it looks big at first glance, but it's like if you understand that this is spread over a long period of time and relative to what we budget for, it really isn't that big of a burden. And in exchange for this you know, one-time investment, you get dividends that will pay off indefinitely. Yeah, for everything that Elon Musk and uh, Jeff Bezos and others have promised, have talked about, you know, we want to do this, we want to do that. And it's like, well, if you're going to be doing that with rockets, you're going to be creating a ton of pollution. It's going to be inefficient. It's going to cost more than it would this way. And uh, it'll take longer. So why aren't you guys investing in a space elevator? <laughs> you know, that's, that's my, that's, <laughs> that's that's my message. Yeah. Yes, that, that is, that'd be my message there. And, and honestly, I think, you know, I would love the chance to go to Jeff Bezos and say, you really want to show Elon Musk up, invest in this. And, you know, Musk, same message. <laughs> Richard Branson, same message. Hey, you know, all you guys, just <laughs> why don't you just put aside your differences and work on this? Yeah, let me follow up on that, which I think is very, very interesting. It turns out that what we really advertise at the top level is we can enable your dreams. Let me give you an example if we're going to do a million tons to the surface of Mars, which is what Mr. Musk wants to do, and you divide by the number of launches, it's 50,000 launches. And when we get going, we can have 170,000 tons per year delivered to his surface. So that's like six years. So what we're saying is that we can deliver on the needs of the dreamers. Let me give you one other example that blows me away every time I start looking at it, which is the L5 Society started and the National Space Society has continued and other people believe it, that we really need to have humans off planet living productively. And they talk about an L5 location, which is a settlement in a rotating space station at the height of the moon, but trading the moon. And it basically is... 10 million tons of mass to contain 100,000 people. And if you take 10 million tons and divide by 20 kilo, I mean, 20 tons per launch, that's a lot of launches. And we can enable missions like that. So I like to think we're an enabler of dreams for the, the human race. Oh, God, yeah. And it is a long-standing dream, and, and uh, that's another thing about Space Elevator. All the advocates, enthusiasts, people who've studied the idea over more than a century now, they've all been pretty clear on what would be possible, and essentially it comes down to humanity becoming a space-faring interplanetary civilization, maybe more. So that is definitely something I'd like to see happen. Okay. In fact, I think this, that's a perfect place to, uh, to end this. I think we have uh, put a wonderful cap on all this, on this topic here. This is a wonderful, fascinating, and uh, like I said, a time-honored topic. And there's a reason people keep coming back to it. So listeners, if there's one thing, hopefully, that you'll take away from this, it's that things are happening, there's movements, and we are getting ever closer to the point where 
a very long-standing dream of space exploration is finally on the, at the point where it's realizable. And that's true of a lot of different dreams, and that's part of what makes the whole renewed era of space exploration or new space age so very, very exciting. So, yes, Adrian and Peter, thank you so much for coming on and letting uh, my listeners know about this, the fulfillment of this dream. And uh, yeah, I hope to talk again, and yeah, best of luck to you uh, in Paris. Well, thank, thank you very much, much, Matthew. This has been Stories from Space. I'm Matt Williams. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Stories from Space podcast with Matthew Williams. If you learned something new and this podcast made you think, then share ITSPmagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.